Well, as I said before, I read the text in order to save a bit of time, so let's go ahead and get in, into the passage now. And I thought since it's been a couple of weeks, since we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke, I would do just a little bit of review. Now, we've, we've seen uh, so far the Lord uh, sending Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. And remember, Bethlehem, uh, the, the, the name in Hebrew, essentially means the, the house of bread. And he sends Joseph and Mary there in order that he might bring uh, or essentially send the bread of, that gives life into the world, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the manna which comes down from heaven that gives life to the world. Uh, we saw the angel announcing the good news of his birth to the shepherds uh, in order that they might be able to go and witness the birth of the Messiah, as well as to relate the things that the angels told them and the things they saw. Remember, after the angel gave the message, uh, several angels appeared in the heavens glorifying and praising God for the mercy that he was showing mankind. Remember, the angels uh, are those who were created to uh, serve those who would inherit salvation. And as they see this plan unfolding, they glorify God and they rejoice in it, something that we ought to be doing as well as we see his plan unfolding uh, in this world. But as, as they see the angels glorifying God, it gave them something more to tell those who had gathered around this birth that they could, uh, again, know who this one is, that the Lord would even send his angels out there not only to announce the birth, but also to glorify God for it. We see the shepherds go and find the child and begin telling everybody the things that they had seen and heard about him. Uh, <laughs> Again, the things that we ought to do as believers. We have also seen and we have also heard many things about Jesus. And we should do what we can to tell others about them. We saw Jesus receive the mark of God's covenant with Abraham. Remember his circumcision showing on, on the eighth day, showing that he is a child of Abraham and even more specifically that he is the seed that was promised to Abraham through whom all the nations would be blessed. We saw Joseph and Mary give to Jesus the name which was given them by the angel. And remember, Jesus is really the, um, the, the, Greek, the Greek transliteration of the word um, Yahshua or Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation, which again reminds us of why Jesus came into the world. We saw his presentation to the Lord at Jerusalem. Jesus, remember, was the firstborn child. And the firstborn child had to be presented to the Lord in order that he might be redeemed, you know, not from sin, but redeemed from, uh, as it were, service to the Lord as the Lord had claimed all the firstborn of his people when he slew all the firstborn in Egypt. And the price of that redemption was five shekels. They came to the temple in order to pay that money. But again, we had here another picture of Jesus' mission to come into the world to lay down his life in order to redeem us from our sins. We saw that while he was at the temple for uh, this um, redemption that uh, Rabbin Simeon came and he prophesied. Remember there were only I think seven or eight rabbins in the history of, uh, of the Jewish culture and of their religion. A rabbin is like a, some sort of a, an elevated rabbi. Uh, this man was the son of the famous rabbi Hillel and he was also the father of Gamaliel, who was the rabbi that taught Saul when he was a Pharisee, whom we know became, by God's grace, the Apostle Paul. But we saw his prophecies. He confirms by the Holy Spirit again not only that Jesus is the Lord's Messiah, but that he must suffer and die in order to bring the light of God's salvation both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And at the temple, we also saw Anna's prophetic confirmation. Remember the one who served the Lord day and night with fastings and prayers in the temple for so many years after she had become a widow. And then finally, we saw Joseph and Mary return to Nazareth, where Jesus continued to grow, both physically and intellectually. And, and that is very important. He grew intellectually. He grew in wisdom, reminding us that he is fully man as well as fully God. Now this morning Luke goes on to give us, as I've already mentioned, the only direct glimpse that we have in Scripture of Jesus' childhood, and more specifically, something of what he did as a child. Now we know something of what happened to him as a child, and you know, that, that we see scattered through Scripture. We know that he was born in Bethlehem, we've already seen that. 
we knew, know that he lived there for two years um, because of the, again, when Herod tried to kill the child, he uh, determined from the time that the star appeared and from the wise men about how old he was, he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem in order to kill all the male children who were two years and younger. So we know he lived in Bethlehem for two years. We know that when Herod sent these soldiers, that his parents took him into Egypt in order to uh, preserve his life, but also to fulfill prophecy. Remember the scripture says, out of Egypt, I called my son, which is talking about, you know, again, the exodus under Moses, which was a picture of our Lord Jesus going into Egypt and then coming out. He is as it were, uh, recapitulating the history of his people in a certain way. But the history of his people, in, in a very real sense, was also a picture of what Jesus was going to do. And we also know that Jesus grew up in Nazareth. We also know a little bit about what Jesus did in Nazareth. We know that he followed his father's trade, that he was called a carpenter in Mark 6, verse 3. But really, this is the only record of what he actually did during his childhood. And what he did is what his father and our father in heaven wants all of his children to do. That's what he wants all of us to do and what he wants our children to do and what he wants us to train our children to do. And the three things that we see in this passage are essentially these. That Jesus worshipped his father. That Jesus made a concerted effort to learn as much as he could of his Father's will. And that Jesus did what it is that he learned about his Father's will. So first of all, we see that Jesus worshipped his Father. And we do have to note from our text here that he wasn't the only one who was worshipping him. That his parents also had a heart to, to do this. Luke tells us in verse 41 that every year Joseph and Mary went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. <coughs> That's essentially the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Bible tells us, and you'll have to excuse me, I feel myself getting a bit warm. I'm, the Lord blessed me while I was on vacation with, with two colds, <coughs> and I'm at the tail end and at the nagging cough part of it, so I'm hoping that um, I might be able to make it through here. Perhaps... If someone would be so kind maybe to turn up this fan, I think I would do much better. Does anybody know how to operate the fans over here? <coughs> okay, to the far front and click it, click it just one, one way to the right, one click to the right. You got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Lord rewards you for that act of service. Okay, now things are going to get kind of breezy, but that's okay. All right, now as I was saying, there were three feasts that all the Jewish men were required to attend each year. <coughs> and of course, this was one of them. We read in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, where Moses says this, Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread and at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Now, that was required of all the Jewish men. Women could attend if they wanted to, if their hearts moved them to, but they were not required to do so. But here we see that it was in Mary's heart to go with Joseph, and both of them were faithful to attend, the again, this feast every year. But not only did they attend but they also brought Jesus. Now, we're not told that Jesus was brought every time, but certainly he was brought this time, and it reminds us of the importance of taking our children also to worship. Now, one thing I should mention is this, that children also were not required to attend the feast. At least the, you know, the boys were not required to attend until they reached age 13. It's interesting because Jesus here is 12, right? At age 13, a Jewish boy would have what's called his bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means essentially son of the law. And it's when they became subject to the law as the adults. 
The bar mitzvah is the Jewish rite of passage, and that's different in every culture, but this is what it was in the Jewish culture. It marks their transition from childhood to adulthood. Girls also would go through something similar that was called a bat mitzvah, or daughter of the law. And again, it served the same purpose. Now, Jesus was 12, and that means that he was not at the feast because the law required it. He didn't have to be there, but he was there likely for two reasons. First of all, because his parents were training him, training him to do what God called them to do. I understand that at 12 years of age, even though the children uh, were not required to be involved in what was going on during these ceremonial feasts, like the fastings and so forth, that they began to train them how to fast. And so they would have them fast during their 12th year in preparation for that. So the parents were training him. But he was also there because he wanted to be there. Can you imagine 12-year-old children tugging on your, on your uh, sleeve or whatever. Of course, a 12-year-old wouldn't be doing that necessarily, but just think about 12 and younger, begging you, asking you, can I go with you to church today? Can I go to worship? I think that'd be an unusual uh, sight, maybe something we don't see very often, but certainly we have to believe that was the heart of our Lord. Jesus wanted to be here. Jesus wanted to be here to participate in a feast that was essentially a memorial, remember, of God's redemption of his people out of Egypt, which was a picture of the redemption that Jesus actually came into the world to accomplish. So Jesus wanted to be there, and his parents wanted him to be there as well. Now, there's also something else interesting that Luke tells us. He tells us not only that they came, but he tells us that they stayed there the full number of days, and that's a significant statement. Because Jewish men were only required to stay at the feast for the first two days of the feast, and the feast went for seven days, uh, after which they could leave, they could go back home. But Joseph and Mary stayed for the full seven days of the feast, and we'll notice in a minute that Jesus stayed even longer than that. They stayed because they wanted to worship the Lord. Now, we, we do need to understand that this doesn't mean that they only worship the Lord three times a year. Uh, there was worship going on all the time in the community of the faithful Jews. Uh, and being faithful Jews, Joseph and Mary were, would be worshiping the Lord every day in their homes, uh, at least reciting Scripture. They may not have had copies of it, but reciting Scripture and trying to relate to their children what they had heard at the synagogue. They would worship in the synagogue every Sabbath, which would be Saturday for them. But, of course, for us, the Lord's Day is the first day of the week. And, of course, they would worship the Lord in the way that they lived, by walking in God's ways. Now, again, we know that Jesus was involved in all these things, and we know that Jesus did all these things because he needed to provide for us a perfect righteousness. But we also need to understand that he did this because this is what he wanted to do. This was what was in his heart. This is what it means to love God, to worship him, to meet with his people, to do the things that the Lord requires of us. That's how we show our love. But he also did this, remember, to give us an example. Sometimes we read the Bible and it's hard to figure out exactly what it's saying. But when we look at Jesus... We see him living the life that we're actually called to live. So we should be able to see what it is God wants us to be doing from the example of Jesus. And if we have any question then about worship, all we need to do is see what it is that Jesus did. And if we have any question of what we should be doing as children in worshiping the Lord, again, look to Jesus. So what is it that we should do based on this example? First of all, I think faithfulness in our worship. Daily in our homes, family worship, personal worship in our time with the Lord. Weekly on His day in the morning and the evening worship services, ask yourself this question. If Jesus were here, would He attend? Would He attend the worship services? Would He go morning and evening? Would He go just morning, just evening? Would He not come at all? What do you think He would do? Well, that's exactly what we're supposed to do, is what he would do. And what would Jesus do each day of his life? Would he be out trying to find the, sort of the next high? 
uh, the next thing that he could do to, to bring sort of pleasure to himself? Or would he be seeking to bring pleasure to his father as he spends his whole life in worshiping him? Well, we need to live like Jesus. We need to live to please the Lord. We need to do what we know Jesus would do. Sometimes, again, oddly, we would allow ourselves to do things we know Jesus wouldn't do. But they're not supposed to be two separate standards, but, but one. And Jesus is the one who gives us that standard. And, of course, from the example of Joseph and Mary, we also need to learn from this to teach and encourage our children also to do these things, to worship the Lord. I mean, they don't come into the world wanting to do these things. They don't come into the world knowing they're supposed to do these things. They need to learn about these things, and the way they learn about them is through us. Now, another thing, too, from Joseph and Mary's example of staying there for the full, you know, the full time of the feast, I think it, it also teaches us the importance of making the most of the time that we have when we are together. Again, they stayed the whole time, not just what was required, you know, just the two days, but they stayed the seven days, and Jesus stayed even longer. I think we should try to make the most of the time that we have when we're together, Try to be here on, on time when the worship service begins. Stay to the end. Stay afterwards for food and, and for the fellowship and not be so quick to leave. And we should do this even if it creates difficulties. One thing that I don't know, it's not stated here, but it's implied. Joseph and Mary, remember, were, were actually quite poor, weren't they? When it came time to offer the sacrifice for Mary's purification, they didn't offer a larger animal, but they offered the two birds, remember, the sacrifice, and that meant that they were poor, which means that coming to the feast would have created a financial hardship for them, wouldn't it? And yet, they not only came every year, they not only brought the whole family every year, but they also uh, stayed the whole period of time. That's like um, you know, going somewhere and having to rent a, an inn or a hotel for a certain period of time and having to eat out for that period of time for somebody that's poor, that would be very difficult to do. But they were willing to do it even at that personal level of sacrifice. They were willing to, to make God's priorities their priorities. So I think the first thing we need to see here is we need to look at our priorities when it comes to worship and whether we have put it in the same place that the Lord puts it. Now, secondly, we notice that Jesus made a concerted effort to learn more about his Father's will. After the feast was over, Jesus' parents returned to Nazareth, we see, and they didn't know that Jesus had stayed behind. Now, Luke tells us that they were traveling in a caravan, that there were many relatives, there were many acquaintances there, and so they, they I mean, they didn't just take off and, and not even think about Jesus for a full day. They assumed that Jesus was among one of these acquaintances, one of these relatives, because they knew what kind of child Jesus was. Not the kind that you want to kind of distance yourself from, but the one that is, that is so good, you know, so nice to be with because he's always so polite and so considerate and, and he's always trying to help and serve and he's doing everything right. I mean, everybody would love to have Jesus with them, especially adults, because you rarely see children like this, right? Now, they wouldn't be offended by that, not yet, because Jesus had not grown up to adulthood and began reproving people of their sins and so forth. So they loved Jesus, and they assumed that Jesus was, was just simply with one of them, enjoying his company. But after they had gone a full day's journey and they began looking for him, they realized that he was left behind. So they headed back to Jerusalem. And after searching for three days, they found him. In the temple, of course, the first place they should have looked, surrounded by the Jewish teachers, listening to them and asking them questions and apparently also answering questions that they were putting to him. But unlike the other students that these teachers had, particularly in that age range, he was amazing them with his understanding and his, his answers. Now, I know that when we read this passage, we think, ah, oh, well, yeah, you know, Jesus is God. Of course, he's going, to be, he's going to be teaching them what they need to know. But we, we need to make sure we don't look at Jesus in quite that way because Jesus, though he is fully God, is also fully man. And we've already seen as man, he needs to learn. He was growing in his wisdom. 
Now, as God, we know he has unlimited knowledge, but not as man. As a man, he needs to be taught. He had to learn. And by the way, we don't have time to get into this in too much detail, but what this means is that his human understanding did not include in it his, his infinite divine understanding. There was a communication between the two natures through the Holy Spirit, but the man Christ Jesus did not walk around on this earth with infinite knowledge packed in his brain. If that were true, then how could Luke say in verses 40 and, and verse 52 that Jesus grew in wisdom? If he had infinite wisdom, you can't grow beyond that, right? So Jesus as a man had to grow. But I, the thing I want us to notice here is this, is that he wanted to grow. He wanted to learn. And that's why when his parents made their last stop, and this is something that customarily the Jews would do when they were leaving the feast before they left Jerusalem, they would always stop at the temple. And apparently when they stopped, they didn't notice that Jesus stayed, okay? But, but Jesus stayed. He stayed that he might learn. He stayed that he might grow. Now, we need to understand at the same time that his learning was beyond the years, uh, beyond his years, and that's because the Holy Spirit was also teaching him, wasn't he? You know, he was communicating to him and instructing him. As we read in the Scriptures, the Spirit of God opens his ear day by day, and he listens and he learns as a disciple. So he was being discipled by the Spirit, and he was being discipled by human teachers, and that's one of the reasons why these teachers were amazed at the answers that Jesus was giving. But again, he needed to learn, and he loved his father so much that he wanted to learn as much as he possibly could. Now, if we love the Lord, which we do if we have the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts, then we want to learn as well. But our desire to learn is going to be dependent upon how much we love the Lord and want to please Him. Jesus loved Him with His whole heart and wanted to please Him with His whole life. So He was going these extra, you know, taking these extra steps to learn even more, to be around the ways in which He could learn even more so that He might please His Father. So we need to pray that the Lord would strengthen our love so that we would desire to learn more that we might please him more. Now, another question arises here, and that is, what about Jesus staying behind? Uh, is that an example that we're to follow? <laughs> it almost sounds, you know, when you, at first glance, it almost seems like that's something Jesus shouldn't have done. But obviously, we know Jesus never sinned. So is this something we should do? Is this something we should follow? Yes, it is. If we understand exactly what it was he was doing, now, we know he didn't sin. We know he did not directly disobey his earthly parents. We know he didn't purposely try to hide from them or hide what he was doing. He didn't try to dishonor his heavenly father, but rather he was seeking to please his father. But the thing is, his parents should have known that this is what he was doing. Didn't you know I would be at my father's house? Didn't you know that this is where I would, would be? I mean, they didn't know he was with them in the caravan. They searched Jerusalem for three days until they came to the temple. Didn't you know this is where I should be? This is what they should have known. This is where Jesus' heart was. Okay, now think about this. Did Jesus do something that was wrong? What if one day we took our children to church? This happens sometimes, you know. Parents leave. It hasn't happened very often, but parents will leave, and suddenly a child realizes that the child's been left behind, and the parents don't realize till they get home. Suddenly they're shocked and they come back and so forth. But what if you were taking your children to church one day and you get home, one day you discover you get home and they didn't make the return trip with, with you, but you, know, you, you go back to the church to find them and you, and you discover that they stayed behind purposely so that they might better learn how to honor and worship the Lord. Now, let me ask you the question. If that happened to you, would you be angry? at your child for that? I don't think so. I think rather it's like, <laughs> whoa, you know, we, we'd be amazed if we saw that kind of character within our children. As a matter of fact, sometimes we, we, we are amazed to see it in adult Christians, right? At least in today's worlds. But this is the kind of heart we should all have to want to stay behind, 
and learn more rather than, you know, get out of town as it were as, as quickly as we can. Now, again, Joseph and Mary didn't fully understand everything that Jesus was talking to them about, but we, we do know that they had learned to trust him. They, didn't, they knew he was supernaturally conceived. They knew there was something very special about him. They knew his name was Emmanuel and Jesus, God with us, and the Lord is our salvation. They knew he was the Messiah. Um, but yet, knowing these things, they still didn't fully understand what was going on. But they trusted Jesus, and they took him home. Now, finally, we see Jesus' obedience to his Father's will. He returned with them to Nazareth. He continued in subjection to them as he matured from childhood to adulthood. Now, again, this is what we're striving after as parents is that our children would obey us. Now, not obey us, not that we're supposed to tyrannize our children and, and tell them to become our slaves and, and this type of thing, but we teach them the truth. We, we tell them what God wants them to be. And we, we try to get them to move in that direction and submit to that. That's what we are to do as, as parents. That's what Jesus did. And even after he was grown up and had begun his ministry, we need to understand Jesus didn't say to his parents, later, you know, I don't have to listen to you anymore. But we see at the wedding of Cana when Jesus' mother comes to him and says they don't have any wine, it almost sounds like Jesus is reproving her, woman, what do I have to do with you? But then she says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do it, which means that she knows that Jesus is going to do what she has asked him to do, and he does. And even at the cross, when he's on the cross and he sees his mother with John, he says, woman, behold your son, and, and then John, behold your mother, and, and he's taking care of her, still honoring her, and he did this throughout his life. Now, he did this because he was seeking to please his father because he was fulfilling the righteousness of the law, because this is the right thing to do. He did it for our salvation, and he also did it as an example to us. And as he grew, Luke tells us that those who knew him grew in their admiration. He grew in favor with, with God and man. The people who knew him, I mean, again, you can imagine if you saw a child doing everything that they're supposed to be doing without having to be disciplined, at any moment, you would be surprised, and I think you would admire them as well. But notice also his father, uh, Luke tells us that he, uh, in verse 52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. Th does that strike you as sort of an odd thing, to grow in favor with God? How can that be? I mean, hasn't the father always loved his son with an infinite love from all eternity? How could he grow from there? Well, the fact is, Jesus, again, was also man. And as the father watched Jesus grow, as he saw Jesus learning his will and obeying him because he loved him, the father's admiration for Jesus as a man continued to grow to the point where when Jesus presented himself for baptism, the father publicly expressed his approval of his son. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Now again, if we think of that in terms of just divinity, we say, well, of course that's true. Why, I mean, why would he say that? Why would he have to say that? Well, maybe because he's trying to let everybody else know, but he's also letting Jesus know and the people around him, that this one who is his son is living the kind of life that pleases him. He grew in favor with God. Now, again, Jesus did this in order to save us. He did it mainly because of his love for his father. And thinking of those two things, think of this. If we want to be saved, we do need to look to Jesus and to him alone, to his obedience alone, and trust in him alone in order to be saved. We do not save ourselves through our good works, but on the other hand, if we want to please the Father, we do need to obey Him, right? And of course, we need to obey Him as the evidence that we've been saved, but we also need to obey Him if we want to please Him. It doesn't please Him simply to be in His family and to not be obedient. It pleases the Lord when we are obedient children. And that's what the example of Jesus teaches us. Jesus wanted to know his will. 
He learned his will, and he didn't just know it and approve of it and say, this is good, and then do something else. He actually did what the Father uh, wanted him to do, what was pleasing to the Father because he loved him. And if we want to please the Father, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to study his will. We need to uh, worship him with our whole lives. Uh, you know, again, initially, we need to attend his worship, study, learn, and then apply, do what the Lord calls us to do. And if we do that, th through the Lord Jesus Christ, even though what we do is very imperfect, the Father will see and he'll be pleased. You know, he loves us all. He loves us as his children within the Lord Jesus Christ. I think there's a sense in which his love for us could not be greater. But you can still so love someone and not be pleased with what they're doing, right? If you want to please him as well as be loved by him, you know, we need to work. We need to learn. We need to apply. We need to do what he calls us to do. So may the Lord help us to do what we know he would have us to do. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to give us the, the grace uh, to do so.